Good morning. This is Senate Judiciary. This is 2-22-22, and it's a Tuesday morning, and it's Washington's birthday. He'd be 290 years old today. Ooh. So, mm. Mm. anyway, uh, mm. we're taking up first S-228, an act relating to prohibiting no-knock warrants, and somebody's at the door, and I need to go check on that. So, if... Hold oh. off for two seconds. I just want to check. Hey. See Marley running around in the background? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know who runs that household. <laughs> the, the only thing, the only two things I like about Zoom is that we don't have to wear grown up pants and <laughs> we can see everybody's pets. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I, I like it when people that you think of as very serious people, all of a sudden you see them on Zoom and their cat walks in front and they're <laughs> petting the cat and... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Senator Campion had somebody deliver a cherry pie. Is that right? They were supposed to bring it right in to you. Yeah, well, anyhow. <laughs> that's because your mother always baked them on this day. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. I think it was Senator Campion. Maybe it was food, Senator White. I think it did. <laughs> well, thank you to whomever sent the cherry pie. <laughs> All right. Better than cutting down trees today. It is. Yeah. I've got enough limbs in the yard to pick up once the once the yard dries out. I don't need to chop any trees down. Well Senator Campion made the arrangements on who baked it. So I have no idea how good it is. Oh okay. Well thank you very much, Senator White. Yes, my mother always did make a cherry pie on Washington's birthday. <laughs> and we had log cabin syrup on Lincoln's birthday, but I don't <laughs> get log cabin anymore. <laughs> um, back to rule 41. Um, has to do with no knock warrants. And the committee was going to have a discussion about the bill S-228, which would um, prohibit, uh, or at least um, not prohibit, but require that no knock warrants have certain provisions. And Eric, would you remind us a little bit about the no knock warrant? The issue, it seems that that's more of an issue when there's an extrinsic circumstance. Is that correct? That somebody hears a gunshot, a gunshot, and they would go in without a warrant or without um, without announcing. I think there's a variety of circumstances that it, it could come up under Senator Sears, and it's a matter of whether a, a judicial officer would issue a warrant that permitted uh, permitted the warrant to be executed without knocking and announcing. So it could be an exigent circumstance like you just described. Um, if you uh, think about the constitutional basis of the knock and announce requirement, which is the Fourth Amendment. So generally speaking, the Fourth Amendment requires knocking and announcing uh, the officer's presence before the officer executes the warrant, or in other words, goes inside residence and either looks for the property or the person that, that the warrant is described that they should be looking for. But there are some exceptions to that under the Constitution. For example, if uh, it, there's a, a belief that, uh, that evidence might be destroyed or if that the officer or somebody else might be harmed if, if they did knock and announce, or if uh, there might be some other 
I think the way the court has phrased it uh, is, I'll just read that language for you now, just so it's helpful to actually hear what the court said in this, but, um, and this is the, the Second Circuit in the United States, the Acosta case articulated uh, some of the exemptions as did the United States Supreme Court of Richards v. Wisconsin. So the two that I just mentioned, the exceptions to the no-knock requirement would be when the officers reasonably fear violence may result if they were to announce their presence, or when officers have reason to believe evidence may, destroy, may be destroyed if they were to provide notice, or when an announcement by the officers would be futile, as may occur when the circumstances indicate that, that the inhabitants are well aware of the officer's presence. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court sort of expanded on, on that a little bit and said that, um, that it's really a, a particular decision. In other words, um, the reasonableness is the key factor, whether the police decision not to knock and announce in a particular case is reasonable. And it's the duty of the court confronted with the question to determine whether the facts and circumstances of the particular entry justify dispensing with the knock and announce requirement. So uh, sort of their general statement, this is in the Richard v. Wisconsin case, is that in order to justify a no-knock entry, the police must have a reasonable suspicion that knocking and announcing their presence under the particular circumstances would be dangerous or futile or that it would inhibit the effective investigation of the crime by, for example, allowing the destruction of evidence. So that kind of gives you a sense of what the, uh, the constitutional exceptions are. And, um, and, and you can sort of compare that to what the exceptions are in S-228. So the, in other words, the exceptions are more broad as I just read them in S-228, the, the exception that's permitted for uh, if there's a general prohibition on the use of no-knock warrants, unless the affidavit submitted by the officer demonstrates to the satisfaction of the court that identifying the presence of the officer is likely to create an imminent threat of, uh, of serious bodily harm to the officer or somebody else. So you have the harm exception, but the other ones are not there. So the, this prohibition is broader than the constitutional prohibition. So that's the, the nutshell of it. Um, but as you said, Senator Sayers, there's also the, uh, the uh, rule that governs the issuance and execution of warrants is Rule 41 of the Vermont Rules of Criminal Procedure. And um, that provides a lot of guidance as well as to the procedures that have to be followed, what uh, the law enforcement officer has to demonstrate to the court, to the judicial officer, what the judicial officer has to find before they issue the warrant. So all of that applies as well. It sort of creates a a regulatory process, so to speak, of um, what evidence must be presented and what the court has to find before it, before it issues the warrant. And that sort of overlays everything because the court, the judicial officer has to, has to make that finding. Yeah, yeah. That would help, we could, I, I had submitted the rule to the language of the rule. It's on the webpage, I could pull it up. We could look at it a little bit if you, yeah, that might help. That yeah. Yeah, the one thing I heard from Matt Valerio was that um, objective reasonable belief um, yeah, and um, passing a bill can be a sim symbolic gesture. That there, Mike Sherling said they're extremely rare and John Campbell agreed with him. Um, But anyway, yeah, why don't you pull up rule 41 and we can see if that's. Sure, sure. Sounds good. Let me. Uh, While he's doing look. that, I will put up the Senator White's pie if you can see Ooh, it. Nice. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you so much. The country club made it. That's a campion deal. No, he didn't make it. No, no, the country club. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's you know, <laughs> rich people go there. You know, I, I go to Hoosick Falls. You know, over common folk. No, I like the country club too. God, I forget we're on Zoom sometimes. All right. Okay. 
Is everyone able to see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. And generally, a state attorney approves the warrants. Is that the general practice? I'm looking at A. I, I, I missed that. I didn't hear that. Sorry, Senator Sears. Generally, the state attorney asks for the warrant, not the police officer, even though they can. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Although I think that sometimes the officer does as well. But yeah, I think that's the general process. Yep. Yeah, I know and in Bennington County, it has to go through the, well, at least the last time I checked, it had to go through the state attorney. Right. That was her policy. Right. And it does have to be uh, coming from the law enforcement, whether it's the officer or the attorney, uh, to the court. And the court has to make a probable cause finding. So if we skip just for a second down to D, I think it's kind of helpful to look at D and then go back up to B. But if you look at D1, um, probable cause. So judicial officer shall issue the warrant if the officer is satisfied there's probable cause to believe the grounds for the application exist. Now it's based upon the affidavit or affidavits or sworn testimony. So the law enforcement officer has to provide a sworn affidavit or other sworn testimony in support of their application for the warrant. You see the next sentence, finding a probable cause shall be based upon substantial evidence. So it has to be something more than, for example, that would suggest more likely than not, which is uh, substantial suggests something more than that. Um, but it may be hearsay, and provided there's a substantial basis for believing the source of the hearsay to be credible and a factual basis for the information furnished. So the standard is probable cause based upon substantial evidence. So the obvious question is, well, okay, well, probable cause of what? And that sort of brings us back to B. And that tells you what it is that um, uh, maybe searched for or sought on the basis of the warrant, of, uh, through the warrant on the basis of probable cause. So number one, they can, the warrant can be issued to search for and seize any evidence of the commission of a criminal offense. So again, that would be what the probable cause would be required to show in that circumstance. Probable cause uh, that there's evidence of the commission of a crime or contraband, that's B, which is property that is by definition illegal, legal under all circumstances. Contraband, fruits of a crime, or things otherwise criminally possessed. Again, tying that into the probable cause standard, it has to be probable cause, substantial evidence that something of that nature would be found. Uh, weapons or other things by which a crime has been committed. So that's something through which a crime has been committed. A D, person who has been kidnapped or unlawfully restrained. Uh, and then move on to two, it could also be to search for a person who's arrest is authorized by law. So someone who's subject to arrest, the, the search warrant could be to search for that person. So they, again, there'd have to be substantial evidence that there is probable cause that the person is going to be in the location and um, is, uh, sorry, someone think a question? I think that seems to be where the trouble arises on many of these cases. Number two. Um, no, where it's um, search for a person whose arrest has been authorized. Uh, you know, in other cases in other states, that seems to be, you know, going in with a no knock warrant. You know, well, well and also people who uh, the police believe they've been authorized, but are mistaking for someone else. Right. I, that's that seems like a common thread through a bunch of them. Yeah. No. Yeah. The uh, it seems so that that factor has been I think come up a lot. Um, yeah. Three and four. You see, there's also uh, a method by which the warrant can seek to monitor conversations for which one party has consented in order to obtain evidence of the commission of the crime. Um, and number four. Do what does it, one party mean? Um, does it mean law enforcement or does it mean like the wife? 
That's a good question. I'm not entirely sure, Senator Sears. I know Vermont is a one-party consent state, so the consent of one party is required. Uh, but I'm not sure. I don't. I can't. I don't believe. You, but if you mean law enforcement being the person who is searching for the warrant, was yeah. applying for the warrant, I should say. No, it has to be a party to the conversation. Okay, so it could be a confidential informant or something like that. I believe. I, I, so. I thought it was also one party where they were going to search. I thought that's what it was. But we can get well, this, this an explanation to, of that. To monitor conversation. I, <laughs> right. That, that's specifically to, to yeah. like almost a wiretap situation that might be described. Yeah. 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 Okay. And there's also specific language in number four for installing a tracking device that's specifically provided for, but those are specific circumstances. Yep. Um, and we went over the denial of the warrant language already that, uh, or sorry, went over, we didn't go over this, but this also, you'll see that the uh, denial would be based on, if you look at the second line down, would be based on lack of probable cause. So the court could determine uh, that there is not sufficient probable cause to support the issuance of the warrant and the application could be denied on that basis. In fact, it, 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 the, uh, um, it would have to be denied if the court finds there's a lack of probable cause. And there's a filing system as well that requires the, the documents to be filed, um, whether it's granted or denied, but that's the denial provision. Uh, so we went through the, the probable cause paragraph here that has to be based upon substantial evidence. You'll see some other specifics about what the recurrent, uh, sorry, what the warrant has to contain. There has to be uh, particular statements about the property uh, that's the subject of the search and or the, describing the place or the person to be searched or conversations to be monitored, whatever it may be. There has to be particularity in the application to describe what it is that is being sought in the warrant. Um, warrant has to, the request has to be made subdivision three in the presence of, a, of the judicial officer, in the presence of the judge or the magistrate. The officer must uh, provide an affidavit or some other sworn testimony in support of the warrant application. <clears throat> uh, the requesting a warrant by reliable electronic means, I, I, I think. Uh, um, I recall, I've been here long enough, I remember that used to say telephonic means, if I remember right, when it was first yeah. added. <laughs> and yep. now that technology has advanced. <laughs> yep. Yeah, originally, so, that was, I remember going my first term, trying to get it by fax. That's right. Wow, warrant by fax. Yeah. One of the first bills I introduced. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, this the evolution of this rule is kind of parallel to the evolution of technology. Yeah. <laughs> Very rare anybody has a fax machine anymore. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, that uh, warrants can be requested that way as well. Um, now, the contents of the warrant, in other words, what has to be in it, um, has to be uh, directed to the law enforcement officer to to and command the officer to search the person or place named for the property or other object specifies and seize it uh, if appropriate. Now you see a couple of time limits there under 5A1 uh, generally has to be served uh, within 10 days. So we have a 10 day time limit on the warrant and it has to be generally be executed between six in the morning and 10 o'clock at night unless the, the court finds for reasonable cause uh, that execution could be done at another time. So the general standard is 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., uh, but if there's a reasonable cause to authorize it to be executed at another time, then that could be provided for. Have, have things like reasonable cause and the standard up above of substantial um, evidence or whatever yes. that was above, have those been defined? Usually we think of clear and convincing, probable cause, that those things are well-defined. 
they aren't specifically defined in the rule itself, but my understanding is that um, that the terms are familiar enough to the courts that they have, and the and the prosecutors and the defense attorneys that they've uh, worked out. I mean, they may dispute in a particular case whether the threshold is met. Of course, whether there's enough evidence to satisfy it. Yeah, but, that, but I'm, that I'm at reasonable cause. Mm -hmm. is not you know you we have clear and convincing we have probable cause is used and now we have reasonable cause that's the only place where i see some i'm not sure what all that means yeah that might be a good question to for the uh, evan evan and matt to weigh in on how that works in practice well, I had a note that the bill used the term satisfaction of the court, and there should be, and I had a note that there ought to be some standard. I think Nevada uses clear and convincing. Um, yeah, or if you want it to be consistent with Rule 41, you could use the same substantial evidence standard that... Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, That is, yeah, that's sort of that way would parallel the rule. Yeah, I was looking at the bill on line 10 on page two. Um, the law enforcement officer with the warrant application demonstrates to the satisfaction of the court rather than by clear and convincing or probable, you know, cause or whatever. Isn't that already in here in Rule 41? They have to prove, they have to show that. Court? Well, I, I'm questioning the term in C little i i. It says reasonable cause. Then up above, it was a different thing. Right. Yeah. That's all I'm questioning. I'm, I'm just at the basis. If that's clearly defined in law, we're in the. That's all I'm questioning here. I don't think, you know, we need to do a, personally, I don't think we need to do a whole rewrite of either Rule 41 or, you know, no knock warrants for Vermont. We seem to be pretty protective. However, um, I'm just questioning the different terms. That covers some of the main principles, but just a couple other things that I want to note. Uh, there are some specific pieces, language that talks about what we've already mentioned, warrant for monitoring conversations, tracking devices, et cetera. Um, uh, some procedural points that are, that are worth uh, uh, understanding for background number six here, that there's um, the warrant application and the affidavit all have to be filed with the clerk of court. So there's this filing system. The, the documents are all kept in the court and the clerk has to assign it a, a number and enter it into a warrant log and a data and a database. So you've got this record keeping uh, system as well that's set up so that uh, the warrants, the applications, the affidavits are all maintained by the court in this database in a warrant log. Also, the execution and return of the warrant. So that means so when the officer actually takes it to the place that's meant to be searched and uh, looking for the property or person to be seized, um, some specific provisions on that. You'll see the officer has to make a, a written inventory as well. So first of all, the execution, um, the officer, uh, the person, officer, sorry, takes the property. They have to give to the person from whom the premises, from whose premises the property was taken, a copy of the warrant and a receipt for any property taken. So they get a copy of the warrant, receipt for property, um, and leave a copy there, or sorry, or leave it there at the place from which the property was taken. There has to be an inventory as well, which is a, a written uh, inventory of any property that was taken. The officer has to compile that. And the return, and number three, is that means that they have to bring this back to the court for filing again. So no later than five calendar days after the warrant was executed. So after the search or seizure was made, no more than five calendar days after that, uh, the officer has to file with the court uh, this return that states when the warrant was executed, inventory any property 
that was taken in and a copy of the warrant as well. So that all has to be refiled uh, back in the court after the warrant's executed. Again, you have more specific provisions about these procedures with, re with respect to monitoring conversations, tracking devices, et cetera. Um, e number six, you see there, when it turns out that the warrant is not executed, there still has to be uh, documentation of that. So that is maintained uh, with the clerk of court as well. The person whose property was taken can file a motion to get it back, subdivision F, sub, subsection F, I should say, subsection G, you'll see it's a, a relevant too to S228. That's a motion to suppress. Remember, we talked about that. Uh, so generally speaking, the, the rule provides that a defendant who's agreed by an unlawful search and seizure may make a motion to suppress evidence. Um, if the motion is granted, the evidence shall not be admissible at the trial or at any future hearing or trial. Remember, so that's another part of 228 that's different than this, because under the uh, constitutional decisions about um, knock and announce warrants, the exclusionary rule does not apply. So the courts have pretty uniformly held that uh, if evidence is seized in violation of the knock and announce rule, it is not excluded. So it can still be used uh, in the prosecution against the person. Uh, but that's different in S-228, which provides that if uh, information or evidence is obtained in violation of the knock and announce rule, it's not admissible. And that would be more consistent with the general exclusionary rule that you see in G. Can you go back to the no knock warrant? The court language stuff, or the yeah, yeah. If if the court decides to, what is the standard the court uses? Uh, if there's not going to be any announcement. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh, Reasonable. So these are some, I think this is what you're referring to, Senator Sears, that uh, um, this is the, the first, this is from the Second Circuit case, USV Acosta. Um, so if there's not going to be any knock and announce, is that kind of what you're getting at? When they, yeah, when they might, yeah. right. You'll see several of the more well-established exceptions when knock and announce is not required that are listed right there in the second paragraph down. Uh, when law enforcement officers reasonably fear violence may result, they're going to announce their presence. Uh, if they have reason to believe evidence may be, may be destroyed if they were to provide notice before entry, or when an announcement by officers would be futile, as may occur when circumstances indicate that the inhabitants are well aware of the officer's presence. And uh, the US Supreme Court case in Richards v. Wisconsin, further down below, talks about uh, the same concept, which is uh, that the circumstances are our reasonableness, basically, of you know the when not and out may not be required, and in that case, the the defendant was, um, or actually, I think it was the prosecution was arguing that a, a felony, any felony drug investigation, should always be an exception to the knock and announce requirement. And the court said no, it's not I'm not going to do a blanket rule like that. Instead, it's really based on the particular case, and for and you know, the court said that. For example, felony drug in investigations may frequently present circumstances warranting a no-knock entry. And that doesn't remove the, from the neutral scrutiny of a reviewing court the reasonableness of the policy decision not, can announce, not to knock and announce in a particular case. So instead, in each case, it's the duty of the court to confront uh, the question and determine whether the facts and circumstances of the particular entry justify dispensing with the knock and announce requirement. So it, it is you know, a reasonableness question, which is often the case under the Fourth, right. the fourth Amendment. Um, but the court statement in that last paragraph is similar to the one that you, we just looked at in the Second Circuit case, those first three exceptions, yeah. um, you know. So may I, Senator? Yes, I know so Matt Valerio wants to make a comment too after you, Senator White. Well, I, I was just looking at, um, there was some discussion about whether we should do any rewrite of Rule 41, <laughs> I would be very nervous about us doing any of that. And in both of these cases, they use the word reasonable, which is what is used in Rule 41. So it seems to me that yep. there is some, some understanding about what reasonable means. Yep. Uh, Matt, did you want to comment? 
Well, I did, and, and uh, I would just, and I really, I'm kind of, uh, I, I had come to it quite a while ago, but uh, Senator White sort of just reiterated it. I, uh, we, we who do this work know what the substantial evidence standard means. Um, we, these cases have been, these standards have been litigated. Um, there's a lot of case law around the country. There's case law in Vermont. Um, I would not be tinkering with language that everybody knows and understands in an area of law in Vermont that is not, uh, you know, being abused right now. I, you know, to be perfectly honest, I mean, with the 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 incredibly small number of uh, uh, you know no knock warrants that we have. Uh, like I said, if if uh, the, the before if the uh, legislature wants to make a statement that no knock warrants are disfavored, um, then uh, you know that's about all that this this bill would do in in my view, because the court is ultimately going to apply Rule Forty One in the Constitution unless there's an out and out prohibition on no knock warrants. But as things go are right now, I don't even see that uh, they're being used with enough frequency to make any make it a concern. Now I understand in other states that it's a very very different thing, um, but uh, I'm just not seeing it here. And I, you know, it's I, I should probably, as Defender General, just say, oh, you know, let's get rid of no knock warrants. Um, but as a practical matter, we don't have no knock warrants um, now, except for literally less than a handful a year um, across the entire state. Um, and I, I would point out the the bill S two twenty eight doesn't get rid of no knock warrants. It only um, it it actually reiterates the the current standards um, yeah. Yeah. for for no knock warrants. Um, so like I said, the bill as it came in is more of a, uh, uh, you know, an aspirational statement about how little they should be used, uh, which is something I think that Vermont is currently, uh, complying with. Okay. Thank you. Very helpful. And so you want me to pull the screen down so the committee yeah, can please. discuss? Yeah, please. Yeah, I can't see if Evan has his. I could see Matt, but I can't see Evan. So I right. may want to comment. Uh, Evan, would you like to comment? Yeah, yeah, I, I would if I could. And thank you very much. Sure. I mean, generally, I, I agree. But Evan Aminen, for the record, with the Department of State's attorneys. And I, I agree with, uh, with the Defender General that for the most part, these are, and John Campbell testified to this effect previously, that folks uh, practicing in this area tend to know what these standards mean. And there is some case law that helps provide guidance. But really what those cases highlight is that these determinations are best made on a fact-specific basis in the context of an individual search warrant application or upon review of uh, a challenge to a warrantless search. Um, and in, I think John Campbell mentioned that uh, previously prosecuted many Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force cases. I can think of maybe maybe a few occasions where we might have obtained a no knock warrant, but I actually can't think of any occasions in which we actually executed the warrant in that fashion. And instead, um, the preference was always to try and knock, announce our presence and have a conversation with the residents um, in order to see if we could ascertain what was going on. So even when we obtained these, which were few and far between, I, I can't think of a single ex a case that I handled where they were actually executed in this fashion. Um, and in terms of making a statement, I'm, I'm having recollections of the conversation that occurred earlier in the session in this committee about the aggregate value of, um, of stolen property. And I, I believe the I believe one of the ideas that was kicked around was not necessarily to do something legislatively, but to issue some type of, of letter addressed to businesses and state's attorneys to, to highlight that the legislature appreciated that there was an issue 
and wanted to comment on it, but didn't necessarily see the need to do it in a, in a, in a piece of legislation. And, um, and, and that would certainly be an option available to the committee in this context as well. Uh, well, you know, it, it appears also on the federal, uh, Matt wanted to comment um, again, your hand didn't go down. Thank you. I can think of up and down as I'm getting it uh, there. Uh, you know, it, it, it occurs to me too that one of the things that goes on with no doc warrants to the extent that they exist now is that a court is actually reviewing the decision making to get a no knock warrant. Um, I kind of fear that in the event that you know, no knock warrants. Either the standard is changed, or the, or they are um, somehow, uh, you know, just said, you know, we aren't going to, we aren't going to do them anymore. That this will put law enforcement in a position at times of saying, well, we're going to rely on our ex exigency um, options. That is, and that's a decision yeah. in the field that's not reviewable by the court, and then let the chips fall where they may after the fact. At least with no knock warrants, it is getting judicial review before those decisions are made. And if the court says no, then law enforcement has that uh, decision and defense counsel has that decision. Um, going forward, um, if, uh, if the law enforcement decides to use an exigency uh, um, determination to enter without uh, announcing themselves. Uh, the 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 abuse of this in other jurisdictions uh, goes beyond you know kind of the the practical application of them that we see in Vermont um, and uh, no knock warrants to me are not I, I think everybody sees them as not favored I the thing about them now is at least in Vermont is they at least get judicial review um, in advance rather than putting the officer in a position where they have to make an exigency determination on the street um, at the time after the fact. Uh, it, it, it provides some level of uh, protection and, and guidance that uh, wouldn't otherwise be there if they were outlawed. Um, so I, you know, this, this is a, probably an odd, like I said, an odd position for Defender General to be in, but it's uh, in Vermont, it makes sense to me. Hey, good. Uh, Commissioner Sherling, did you have any comments on this bill? Sorry, Senator, excuse me, trying to get to all the right buttons. Um, nothing, nothing to add uh, beyond my prior testimony and, uh, and agreeing with both uh, the state's attorneys and sheriffs and the defender general. I did have a conversation with a sponsor of the bill, or at least one of the sponsors of the bill, um, Senator Ron Hinsdale, this weekend, and I let her know that we probably would not go further with the bill, that we've taken testimony and that the committee is concerned that we actually could do more damage than not if we go forward with the bill. Um, is that the general sense of the committee to... Senator Baruf. Yeah, I would agree with that and just add that it seems to me um, what the, the bill as written calls for, we already do. So it's, it's really offering just a reduced um, carve out, but there's still a very large carve out there for safety at where the, the issuing officer would make that determination. So I just, I don't see that it would do very much at all in practice. And I think, as you say, we might unintentionally muck up some of the existing uh, case law, so. Senator White. I agree with everything that Philip said. And I, I do, I have no interest in um, either mucking up what's currently happening or in um, passing and spending time on what might be called, I don't know, remember who it was earlier, called a symbolic gesture. 
everybody else, Senator Nitka, Senator Benning. I'm okay with it. I think I think the danger, if it could be, I mean, if we're doing, if we could do, if we wound up doing more harm than good, that would be terrible. So I think it's good this way. I, I mean, I think some of the terms that are in here, you know, make it seem a little shaky that someone might do something with the present situation, but I trust that's not, it's not happening. So I'm fine with not going ahead with this bill. And I just kind of feel that if there was an absence of any kind of regulation whatsoever, this might be something to pursue, but this is so well litigated, so well understood and so very rarely used that I just conclude the bill is not necessary. It appears that in other states, some of the abuses occurred when the wrong address is entered. Oof. And that I hadn't heard anything about that happening in Vermont. There may have been cases, I'm not sure. The, just the, no. the other thing I heard was that um, if, um, I think in one of those Minnesota cases, another play, another state had requested that and the receiving police agency said they would only do it if it was a no knock. I mean, that kind of thing is very disturbing. But, All right. Yeah. I think we're pretty unanimous in that. Eric, thank you so much for going over Rule 41 and helping us to understand the current state of affairs on no knock warrants and warrants and search warrants in general. Um, sure. you know, I, and help, it was also helpful to hear some of the case law behind current laws and current practice. Okay. All right, and Matt, Evan, and uh, Commissioner Sherling, thank you. We're going to switch now to S-140, an act re relating to prohibiting civil arrests at courthouses. And, and um, is Evan Erwin Jacobson here? Erwin? Uh, oh, she's joining right now. Okay. Erwin, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Morning. Um, oh, she's joining right now. Okay. No, she's here. I think someone has their um, YouTube on, so you're hearing it after that. Well, has their YouTube on. Okay. Thank you. Are we good, Maggie? Yeah, I think we're good. All right, Erwin, thank you for being here. I think I just called you Irving. I, I'm sorry, Erwin. It's fine. I've been called worse. And um, maybe this is a good opportunity to say good morning, Chair good Sears, morning. and good morning to the committee. Um, for the record, my name is Erin Jacobson from the Community Thank Justice. You, Aaron. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm from the Community Justice Division of the Attorney General's Office, and I testify today in support of S140, an act relating to civil arrests at courthouses. Thank you for having me. Um, we do have a couple of suggestions for minor amendments, but I would first like to um, start by explaining and then illustrating why we support S140. S140. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we support this bill because it aims to protect not only individuals seeking access to justice in our courts, but actually the courts themselves and our system of government. As the Supreme Court has held, quote, the unhindered and untrammeled functioning of our courts is part of the very foundation of our constitutional democracy. And as our own Justice Reiber has pointed out recently at the height of courthouse arrests by ICE under the Trump administration, fair and free access to our state courts is enshrined in the Vermont constitution. And when that access is foreclosed by fear of civil arrest, 
as you heard direct examples of last week in testimony by migrant justice, we are all less secure. Um, I too have experienced what happens um, when individuals are arrested by ICE in Vermont courthouses. Before I came to the Attorney General's office, I practiced immigration law first at a little nonprofit in Burlington and then at the immigration clinic at Vermont Law School. And during that time, I worked with dozens and dozens of asylum seekers and individuals seeking humanitarian immigration relief because of domestic violence, crime victimization, or trafficking. And twice I had clients who were arrested at Vermont State Courthouses by ICE. Um, the first instance was in 2014 when I received a call from a domestic violence shelter in the Northeast Kingdom. And they were working with a woman who had just been released from ICE custody after ICE arrested her at her hearing where she was seeking a protection order against her abusive husband. And at that hearing in open court, her abuser argued to the judge that the judge shouldn't believe anything his wife was saying that she was undocumented and so therefore she didn't care about the law she didn't care about abiding by laws, um, and so she shouldn't be considered honest or trustworthy. Um, she was granted that order by the judge, but while she was um, waiting to receive a paper copy of the order, ICE came and arrested her right inside the courthouse. They then took her and detained her in um, St. Albans, and then um, from there, she was released to the domestic violence agency because she had nowhere else to go. She could not go home. Um, in the second instance, this was in the summer of 2019, a client of mine went to court um, she, um, where she appeared for her hearing in connection to a very minor um, traffic uh, driving offense. And while she was there um, after um, her plea deal, when she went to the clerk's counter to pay her fine, that's when two ICE officers came and arrested her, again, inside the courthouse. Um, I was not there at the time. I, I was simply her immigration attorney, not her defense attorney. Um, but by the time she was arrested, her defense attorney had left. Luckily, she brought a friend with her, and it was her friend who called me saying that she'd been handcuffed, put in the back of an SUV, um, the friend was following the SUV, she thought probably to the ICE office in St. Albans. Um, I was able to get in touch with ICE. I pled for her release. I explained that she was the sole care provider for a young child, um, but she was held for several hours. And then um, she was placed in removal proceedings where still currently um, she is defending her deportation. So. One thing I wanna point out about these two different arrests is simply that, well, the first, in the first instance, the woman who was seeking a protection order, that was in 2014. So that was under the Obama administration. And at that time, the Obama administration had guidance, uh, very similar to what the Biden administration currently has, that did not directly prohibit um, courthouse arrests, but discouraged them. Um, with the exception for concerns about public safety or maybe national security. Now, in that instance, um, my client had no criminal record whatsoever. Her only immigration violation was that she'd overstayed her visa. Um, so I'm not certain what the, what the public safety concern was there. But again, I wanna just point out that that is a very similar guidance to what the, the current, current administration is following. Of course, in the 2019 example, um, times were very different. We were seeing many, many more courthouse arrests under a different administration, the Trump administration, and their policy um, really was to um, simply arrest as many non-citizens as possible to, um, to deport as many um, violators of immigration law as, as they possibly could, no matter where those arrests happened. Um, so, I guess I, what I just want to point out about that is it's this, though, though in recent years where most courthouse arrests happened, where they were in the news, those in fact did flow from Trump administration prosecutorial priorities. However, 
all, all guidance from ICE is always interim because it can change from one administration to the next. And though there is guidance that protects the rest in certain places like schools and churches, um, courthouses have traditionally never been places um, um, that would fall under what, what is considered a sensitive location or a protected location under ICE guidance. And that remains um, true today. Um, so the trouble here, even where courthouse arrests might be rare um, or there might be federal guidance that um, discourages arrests at our courthouses, um, it still remains true that it puts individuals in fear of going to court. Um, it puts survivors of domestic violence in fear of going to court. And as the first example illustrated, um, when ICE might be um, lurking around our courthouses, when somebody fears going to a court for a protection order, that is something that abusers know is happening and that they can, that can serve as another way of weaponizing um, the threat of immigration enforcement against their victims. And this is a very, very common form of abuse against non-citizens is um, the threat imparted by abusers to victims saying, you shouldn't call the police, you shouldn't call um, a domestic violence agency, you can't trust them, you shouldn't go to court, um, ICE will be there and they'll arrest you. Um, it's a very common tactic. Um, so it's not just those folks who, fear, who might need a protection order um, where our system of justice is then impeded or um, interrupted. Um, people who fear going to court to pay a fine, um, people who fear being a witness that perhaps the state needs to successfully prosecute a crime. When, that, when those things happen, we are all um, less secure. So I, I'll pause here. I, I do, like I said, I do have a, a couple of requests for minor amendments, um, but I guess I would just like to point out that what, what this bill is not, um, this bill does not challenge the federal government's power to regulate immigration. That's not, that's not what this does. Uh, ICE officers can and do arrest people in Vermont. Um, and this bill is not about preventing ICE or any other law enforcement agency from effectuating criminal arrests or arrests accompanied by a warrant. Rather, this bill only aims to codify a long recognized common law protection against civil arrests at courthouses a protection that is really about the sacrosanct nature of our courthouses and about protecting our sovereign interests and having a functioning judiciary that is open and accessible to all without fear of disruption. Um, I'm happy to take questions or I'm happy to go over some of those, um, the amendments that I would like to request, um, but I'll Are there any here. questions? I think you've been quite clear, actually, and it was very helpful to hear about, particularly about the difference between Obama, Biden, and Trump, but the, the fact still remains somebody could be arrested, even when it's discouraged at a courthouse under Biden. Absolutely, they could. That, that, that was helpful. Um, do you have a few changes to suggest? Um, I do. Thank you for the opportunity to, to request those. Um, well, one is that in um, section, this is on page two, um, in, in the penalties and uh, private right of action section, under uh, at line 13 with regarding the powers of the attorney general, mm -hmm. um, we would just suggest that that be made a little bit more clear about the kind of relief that the attorney general can seek should someone violate um, this law. And so would suggest that it say, the office of the attorney general may bring civil action on behalf of the state of Vermont for appropriate equitable or declaratory relief if there is reasonable cause to believe that a violation of subsection A of this section has occurred or will occur. Okay, 
Do you have a copy of that for Eric? Yes, I think I you do. probably got it, but I haven't sent it to him yet. Um, I didn't. I wanted to um, testify yeah. first and see if that was okay. Um, yeah, but I'd, I'd be happy to send my suggestions. Can, yeah, it's easier project. for me to um, ponder that if you could send it to Eric or Eric. It was pretty simple, so I don't think it's that complex. Is no, it's, it's very simple, yes. Um, another um, suggestion would be to... Um, put all of the remedies under one section that is remedies. So there's um, the contempt remedy. Well, that uh, right now that's called penalties. Um, there's the civil action for false imprisonment and there's the attorney general enforcement power. So I would suggest changing penalties to remedies um, and putting the civil action for false imprisonment and civil contempt all into one paragraph with the attorney general remedy being in the second one. And, and in that way, I'm not sure you would even need uh, the provision that talks about um, bringing a civil action in the civil division of the superior court. Not to mention if there is, if, if um, an individual we're going to sue the federal government for a violation of the statute. Um, who, you know, the federal government's not the only people that could violate this, but in that instance, then the federal government probably could not be sued in the civil division of the superior court. It would likely need to be in a federal district court. So I would just strike that, that language and then you could strike that section entirely um, and put the civil action for false imprisonment um, form of relief in with par the subparagraph one about civil contempt proceedings and not and not name which court the civil action for false imprisonment would need to be brought in. I think I got that. I'll send my markup to Eric and um, CC the committee. Okay. Any questions? Eric, do you have any? Uh, no, just that I didn't follow the last piece. So uh, okay. I, would, I would need to see that in writing. Thank you. I'll send it along right now. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Aaron? Um, our next witness is Rebecca Turner, who uh, was here just the other day. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. Good morning. I haven't seen you all year. Now you're a regular. I know. Now you'll see too much of me soon. Um, but good morning, uh, Rebecca Turner from the Defender General's Office for the record on S140. And uh, I'm glad that Erin uh, Jacobson testified before me because she, she um, took care of a lot of the points I wanted to raise. Uh, but uh, to begin with, the Defender General's Office also strongly supports this bill, um, not only for the reasons already stated by the witnesses and that you've already heard about, uh, the, the critical issues and interests that this bill serves to address, right, which is ensuring uh, access to the courts of just basic due process and access uh, by litigants, by witnesses to court proceedings in all courts. Uh, not just criminal, not just family, and um, as well as a recognition that this is a, a fundamental state um, enterprise, and that is to uh, to essentially not be uh, stimmied by federal law enforcement in the administration of state court proceedings. And so th this bill goes a long way in addressing that. And unfortunately, as uh, Attorney Jacobson already described this, the need for, for this kind of legislation hasn't disappeared just because we have a change in the administrations at the federal level. I thought I would address um, one of the concerns or questions I heard uh, last week, which was uh, concerning the, the enforceability of this legislation, perhaps on, on um, federal agents. And what I wanted to share was that 
the sources of law actually uh, exist independently from this bill. And, and it codifies long established common law, uh, common law going back to the, to the uh, 15th century. So English common law that then uh, became incorporated into American federal common law, as well as uh, state common law around the 50 states, but certainly here in Vermont. Um, and that is specifically this privilege uh, against arrest, um, civil arrest, when a person is uh, appearing in a court proceeding for a different matter. And again, that source of law is inherent in the recognition that the courts need to be able to do uh, the business of the courts, that it could easily be uh, disrupted uh, if people who want to conveniently serve or arrest a person they think will be showing up at court at a certain date and time, again, all public information, that they could just stand there on, on the steps of the court or nearby the courthouse and, and arrest the person and prevent them from going forward. And so fundamentally, this has been a, a, a basic principle of our legal system from the very beginning, uh, embedded in our common law found an old 1881 decision from our Vermont Supreme Court recognizing this longstanding privilege. Uh, it's in Ray Healy for the record, uh, 53 VT 694. Um, another thing that is interesting about this privilege, again, just to highlight what this bill does and captures, it really tracks this old common law privilege. It it's includes um, not just the prohibition in the courthouse, Right, but near, uh, near the courthouse, and that again was something that existed in common law. That it didn't just uh, exist when the person was in the courthouse or standing on the steps of the courthouse, but even near the courthouse, out of sight of the courthouse. Uh, the other other aspect of that privilege was that if someone, a litigant, a witness, was concerned that someone might be there ahead of time, they could seek protection from the court in advance. So it didn't have to already be there. So it was called a writ of protection. Again, those kinds of protections are here in this bill. And so all of which to say that this is why I think this law is, is enforceable against federal agents. Uh, certainly, there have been more recent legislation, sorry, recent court decisions, federal court decisions, uh, 2020, uh, early and later in 2020, a federal court in district court in New York considered whether or not uh, ICE could be prevented from making court arrests in, in the state courthouse. And there, the federal district court of New York also recognizes longstanding privilege uh, in common law and, and applied that to these ICE agents as well. Uh, and Embedded in there is also another fundamental sort of constitutional principle, another source of law for the enforceability of this against uh, federal agents, and that is separation of powers. Uh, the federal government certainly has the ability to enforce immigration laws, but states are given the authority to enforce and administer their state laws that is fundamentally taking place in our state courthouses. Um, so I think I think that that this legislation stands on on solid uh, footing in terms of those questions and, and its enforceability, because this has been couched in the sense of 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 affecting fundamentally the due administration of the courts. It is deemed inherent in the powers of the courts to issue contempt um, um, relief and remedy to people who will not honor this. And so uh, again, that is consistent with this bill. I think the only question I had that, that Attorney Jacobson brought up for me when she talked about suggested changes, uh, and I'll have to, I'll be curious to see them in writing, is the requirement that, if I heard that right, that the civil, that the civil action would have to take place in federal court. I'm not sure that's the case or, or whether I misunderstood. Uh, but certainly I think that our state courts uh, have the ability to, to address these issues. If, if the uh, federal agents want to move this to federal courts, they certainly can. Um, the only other suggested am amendment I have on this bill, it's very small. 
and it's on page two, line 11, and it's under the section private right of action. And it's in the reference to injunctive relief. I would just add the additional injunctive and declaratory relief. Again, those are, are common forms of relief that go together. I think Attorney Jacobson right made that reference for the second part in line 13 through 15, um, but that's the only additional change. Otherwise, uh, yeah, if there are any questions, happy to, happy Thank to take you. them. Thank you, it's been pretty clear. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, would, I found interesting um, Attorney Jacobson's comments regarding the um, Vermont Constitution and its um, requirement that the courthouse be um, free and open place, uh, um, fair and free access to our courts is part of the Vermont Constitution. And I suspect that that somewhat comes from our history of distrust for New York. I think that's right. I think it's our history of distrust of, of, of tyranny, period. Um, yeah, but I was going to say is, which is why I'm not a Yankee fan, but that <laughs> it's probably due to tyranny. Um, more than that. <clears throat> that caught a smile from Senator Benning, who happens to be a Yankee fan. Um, uh, Attorney Jacobson. Yes, thank you. Also, a Red Sox fan. Oh, I don't know if you said you're a Sox fan. You just said you're I not did. A I, I, oh, okay. Not a Yankees fan as usual. Well, I meant also, to, yeah. an affirmative yeah. Sox fan. Yeah. Um, yes. I just want to respond to Attorney Turner's um, question about my comments regarding the the venue for a tort claim. I just don't think the bill should specifically state that the civil action must be brought or could only be brought in state court um, because of the issue with um, if an individual wanted to seek um, civil action against uh, a federal officer, it's true that that would likely end up in federal district court according to um, um, federal statutory law. So I just don't think the S-140 should dictate um, any particular venue. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for either Rebecca or uh, Attorney Turner or Attorney Jacobson? All right, why don't we go on to um, migrant justice? And I, is um, Beto with you? A Beto with you? Um, uh, good morning, Senator Sears. Good morning, committee. Good morning. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Will Lambeck for the record with migrant justice. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, uh, Beto uh, is, is still in the milking parlor. He hasn't been able to get out of work uh, on time. Um, so I, I don't think he'll be able to okay. by this morning. I'm, I, I've been watching my phone closely, um, but uh, um, it was going to be a tight shave. Um, I, I can just share in, in broad strokes um, uh, what would be part of the, the subject of Beto's testimony. Uh, he's a, well, as you heard, a, a dairy worker in Vermont. Um, he's lived in Vermont for a, a, a number of years uh, and uh, left Mexico um, uh, fleeing persecution that he was facing as a, a gay man in Mexico. Um, uh, in 2019, uh, he was uh, arrested on, on uh, charges of DUI, uh, was released by the, the police, and then uh, uh, presented for uh, a pre-arraignment conference, I believe, on December 31st of 2019. Um, as he was in the court hearing, uh, uh, ICE agents um, appeared and, and alerted his uh, attorney that they were going to be detaining him uh, at the conclusion of the hearing. Um, and as he left the courtroom, uh, they were there, uh, they, they handcuffed him, uh, and he was held in immigration detention for a number of weeks, uh, despite uh, a pending asylum claim. Uh, he ultimately was successful um, in, in winning his asylum case and, and being granted asylum. Uh, he was released from detention and uh, is, is still uh, in, in Vermont to this day. Um, uh, this was a uh, um, uh, this was a, a, a terrible or, ordeal from him. Uh, he, he was uh, subjected to uh, to abuse and, and pretty atrocious conditions when he was in immigration detention. 
um, uh, and it was also a, a terrible ordeal for the community who who uh, heard about this. This was a um, he's a, a well known person in the community. This is a high profile uh, arrest, um, and and really sent shock waves and and sent the message uh, as you've been hearing um, in testimony throughout uh, on S one forty. Sent the message to uh, to folks in the immigrant community to to stay away from courts. Uh, that it's a, a, a dangerous place that you could be putting your your liberty in jeopardy. Um, and and there's a strong sense of uh, you know people wanting to do the the right thing by by appearing for for court hearings. And um, in, in in this case, where is a, a a DUI and a recognition of you know, I, I, I screwed up, uh, I, I made a mistake here, I wanna go through the process, pay the consequences, what I, whatever I have to do. Um, and that's a, a, a common uh, sentiment for, for people um, in that circumstance. Um, but the, the fear that uh, you'll, you'll be detained by immigration and, and uh, held in, in federal custody and then deported uh, oftentimes outweighs um, the, the desire to, to go through the process and, and have your day in court. Um, uh, and so in, in the wake of Githo's detention, what, what oftentimes happens, unfortunately, is, is that uh, people who have criminal charges um, uh, out of fear of that outcome uh, just decide to, to, to leave the state um, and, and uh, either return to their country of origin sort of uh, pre preemptively um, uh, or just try to go find work in, in another state. Uh, that denies them their due process, uh, their day in court, and, and it's also, um, you know, denies the state the ability to uh, to, to bring forward uh, and, and conclude whatever criminal charges there may be. Um, and as you've heard in testimony from Attorney Jacobson and, and others, uh, criminal matters certainly aren't the only or even the principal way uh, in which uh, uh, people may be court users uh, and this has a chilling effect for people to use the court in a variety of ways, whether they're litigants in a civil suit or a family case or, or what have you. Um, but in, in Beto's particular um, experience, this was a, a, a criminal charge. Um, and uh, so that the, the protection that this uh, law would afford uh, would have allowed him to uh, uh, go to court without fear of arrest, uh, finish the, the criminal proceedings, pay, pay whatever consequences he had to pay um, and, and uh, be um, be subject to, to due process and the equal treatment of the law, of the law that um, any other person could expect um, uh, in a proceeding like that. Uh, so I'm sorry that Beto wasn't able to be here. I am too. Sorry himself, but hope that uh, that gives let, us let answer. him know we're sorry we weren't able to hear from him. But it did a pretty good job of describing his situation and and the problems he faced. I'm interested in you. You said where was he? Held? He was held um, in uh, immigration detention. Um, the, the closest jail with an ICE contract is the Stratford County Correctional Facility in Dover, New Hampshire. That's a federal. Um, it's a, um, it's a, a, a county jail uh, run by the, the Stratford County Sheriff's Office uh, with a federal contract. So there's a, an immigration wing uh, of the county jail. I know that St. Albans Correctional Facility holds some people on uh, federal charges. But, um, they have a certain number of beds for the U.S. Marshal's office, but he wasn't held there. There's, I wasn't familiar that there is a special. Um, yeah, I'm sorry to hear the conditions were um, were set in a facility of that nature. Um, yeah, and, and my my understanding <laughs> that you're um, you're correct that the um, the Northwest uh, Correctional Facility has a contract with the U.S. Marshals. Um, ICE can detain people there up to forty eight hours, I believe, but long term detentions um, go go out of state. Go out of state. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you very much. Um, and and um, I'll add as well that the uh, the, um, the the amendments that uh, Attorney Jacobson pr presented um, uh, also have the support of Migrant Justice. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Any other questions for Will? Thank you. Thanks for being here this morning.
and we let Beto know that we're sorry we couldn't hear from him, but um, we appreciate his testimony through you. I will pass that along. Thank you very much, committee. Yep. All right. Um, Eric. Okay. Um, this is committee discussion time. And markup. It didn't seem too outrageous what was suggested for changes. They appeared minor. Um, would you like 24 hours to try to put that together? Yeah, that makes sense, I think. <clears throat> the only suggestion I'd have is that, uh, and I got uh, Attorney Jacobson's email, and they all make sense to me. Uh, <clears throat> I do question the striking of subdivision D1 about uh, the private right of action. I think the concern expressed was that uh, they didn't want to inadvertently limit someone's ability to file an action in federal court. I don't think the subsection does that, the subdivision does that. It, it simply says that a person may bring an action uh, for injunctive relief. And I agree with adding and declaratory and that other language that was suggested, but it's not an exclusive right of action. The person it wouldn't uh, attempt to, nor could it prohibit a person's ability to bring a federal civil rights action under 1983 or some other basis for a federal cause of action in federal court. So I think it's just one, it's stating expressly that the person has this right of action, which um, they could always try to make out anyway, but um, you know, providing it expressly in statute that a person has a private right creates the cause of action that you know, establishes the legal basis for them to bring this action. And um, so that's the only suggestion I'd have is that I don't think it, it hurts anything. And in fact, may help the, the, pers the violated person's situation by keeping that language. Senator Bruce. Uh, Eric, I, I tend to agree with you. Do you think it makes sense to add a sentence after that uh, in that section saying that it doesn't limit these uh, other venues? Or, or... I've never seen. I don't. I've never, I haven't seen that before. Um, I don't. I don't think it's legally necessary. Um, if you felt like you wanted to add it, I suppose it probably doesn't hurt anything. Um, no, this is where I I rely completely on you. So whatever, whatever you think makes sense in terms of um, when you explained it, you explained that that language wouldn't limit. Uh, and I was just wondering if it made sense to say that explicitly. Yeah, I think sometimes the sometimes the legislature does add you know add language for to make something explicit even if it may not be legally necessary. So uh, I, I don't think it, it the language will foreclose anybody's right to bring a federal lawsuit. But if you wanted to say it, as I say, I don't think there any be any harm done. Um, I, I, actually, I I prefer less usually over more. So I hear, <laughs> I hear you saying that the way you stand behind the way it's written and I stand behind you standing behind it. <laughs> well, hey, thank you. I you certainly know, don't you, have any monopoly on the truth. So I'll, I will be incorrect sometimes too, but I, I appreciate the faith. <laughs> you, you, you make an excellent tag team there. I'm convinced that you're both right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but otherwise, otherwise, I, I see all the uh, helpful suggestions from Attorney Jacobson. I think they all make sense. And uh, um, I could certainly do a, a redraft of that fairly quickly. So whenever, whenever the committee wanted to look at it again. Well, I'm, I'm looking at tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. That would give you time to send out copies to Attorney Jacobson, Attorney Turner, and um, uh, Will Lambeck. Um, to make sure everybody's on the same page and as well as the committee and we could schedule it. We've got you for a committee discussion on supermajority verdicts at trial at nine. So we could move that to nine, <clears throat> nine 30, start at nine with S um, 40, 140, and then at nine 30, go to S 178. And then, um, take our break and then go to 163. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Okay.
Uh, does that work for you, Peggy? Yep. Uh, and Eric, send me the uh, changes and I'll get it to everyone. Great. Thank you, Peggy. Okay. Senator Sears, did we get any response from the U.S. Attorney's Office? Uh, yes, we did. They're not allowed to speak on state laws or state legislation, I should say, not laws, but proposed state legislation. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And that was true of the prior U.S. attorney, and it's true of the current U.S. attorney. So evidently, it doesn't matter which administration's in office in terms of that one. Okay, thanks. I, I yeah. <clears throat> but I do thank Peggy for checking with the U.S. Attorney's Office. All right, I think what we're going to do is just adjourn early, take a half an hour. I'm going to take more pictures of my cherry pie, maybe even put them on Facebook. Uh, maybe eat it. Amy. Well, I, I, you know, no, it's, I, I'm just uh, grateful to friends like Senator White who would work with Senator Campion to make that happen. And I really do appreciate it. It's uh, very nice.